God is so precious. I, hearing you guys sing Amazing Grace and that refrain that uh, was written a few years ago, My Chains Are Gone, I've Been Set Free, it never fails. I look over at my wife and big tears will start rolling down her face. And uh, many of you the same way, it's like you just can't help it. You just can't help it because God has been so good. When you know him, you discover he's been so good and uh, amazing grace. We didn't deserve it. Anybody here think they deserved it? Because you're crazy. None of us deserve it. But he is so good and he blesses us and that's wonderful. Hey, I'm excited. I'm going to talk to you today about a topic that is uh, kind of controversial but shouldn't be. And it has to do with healing. Um, one of those topics that a lot of Christians fight about, but we shouldn't be fighting about it. And uh, the question is, does God still heal people? And I want to talk to you about it and hopefully give you some perspective that maybe will be a little helpful. The very name Jesus, I don't know if you know this, but the name Jesus or Yahshua uh, actually means God saves, but it can also be translated God heals. So that's even a part of the name Jesus. I want you to look at this verse. This will kind of be a launching off place for us. This is from Matthew chapter 9. Uh, the Bible says this about Jesus. Jesus, or Yahshua, went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Wow, healing every disease and sickness. That's awesome. Did a little study this week. 20% of the verses in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 20% of the verses are devoted to telling us stories about Jesus healing people. Obviously, he was touching people every day and things were happening and he was showing us that God can heal, God does heal. He was affirming that he was actually God's man on the earth. He was God's son. John the Baptist was the first one who would actually herald the news that Jesus was God's anointed one, the Messiah. But later, John the Baptist was imprisoned. And so he begins to think, was I confused? And so he sent some of his followers. He said, go talk to Jesus and ask him, is he really the one? And so John's followers went to Jesus and said, are you the one? And this is what Jesus sent back to him. Jesus said, you go tell John that the blind are receiving their sight, that the lame are walking, that those who have leprosy are being cleansed, that those who can't hear can hear now, that the dead are being raised, that the good news is being proclaimed to the poor. You tell John he was right on it. I'm the one. Tell him it's okay. I'm the one. Yet a lot of people question healing. I want you to know that I believe healing is real. I believe that God heals. I believe he still heals today. Some people think miracles have ceased or they have passed away that they don't happen anymore. My own belief is that's not so. My own belief is it does happen. We can't pigeonhole it and say when it's going to happen. We can't put ourselves in the place of God and demand that it happens. But it certainly happens. My error has sometimes been I just wouldn't ask God to do things that maybe he wanted to do. I remember a long time ago I had a smart aleck person in our church. I know that'd be hard to believe. But anyway, this is a smart aleck friend of mine. And he said, Ray, Jesus says the church is to preach and to teach and to heal. You preach and you teach, but what about healing? And I said, well, to tell you the truth, when I try the healing stuff, not much happens. And the smart aleck said, well, when you preach and teach, it doesn't look like much happens either, but that doesn't stop you from preaching and teaching. It's like, ah, get out of, get out of here. I do pray for people who want to be healed. I do pray for them. Um, I carry with me most times, I carry some anointing oil, and if somebody would like me to, I will anoint their head with oil, and I'll pray for them, and I'll say, God, we really pray for this situation. Some people think that healing is automatic. It's automatic, that it's guaranteed. There's a verse in the Bible, look at it on the screen, Isaiah 53, 5, that says, by his stripes we are healed. And so you'll meet people from time to time who will just believe that that means carte blanche, if you're sick, and if you believe in Jesus, it's carte blanche, you can be healed, that you should be healed. And uh, I've had some interesting discussions. I remember once, years and years and years ago, we had no money. I know that's hard to imagine, but our church had no money, and we needed some carpet for our stage we were building in an Eckerd's drugstore that we had taken over. And I went to a carpet guy and was going to talk to him about maybe donating some carpet, and he was a Christ follower, but he got off on this subject about people being sick when they were guaranteed healing because of the atonement, because by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. 
And so I was trying not to get into the conversation because I didn't want to really argue about theology. I wanted free carpet. That's all I wanted. From the, you know, that's all I was interested in. So it's like I listened. And, uh, but he just kept talking. And he finally got off talking about one of the guys that I admired a lot who's a preacher who has cerebral palsy, who had been very influential in my life, a man by the name of David Ring. And this guy was saying if David Ring had faith and if David Ring really knew Jesus, he wouldn't have cerebral palsy. And I had taken about all I could take, and so I ended up just kind of lighting into him. And it was quite a, I had a friend there, and he said, oh, my gosh, that was, ugh, don't ever do that. But I, after about an hour of just heated exchange, he said, let me give you some carpet. And he just gave us the carpet. It's like, thank you, God. I couldn't believe, <laughs> I couldn't believe that. And then this is the truth. About two years later, the man died from cancer. He got cancer. It was from left field. Not saying that there was a cause and effect. I'm just saying I don't believe that in every situation you can claim because Jesus died on the cross by his stripes were healed. Let me show you why that is. Look on the verse. This is the fuller verse. This is a prophecy from Isaiah 53, 5. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. I ask you, if you look at that verse, is there anything there that is implied physical, or is it all implied spiritual? He was pierced for our what? Transgressions. He was crushed for our what? Our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. It's definitely saying that Christ came and Christ was going to die, but his death was going to make available to us salvation, spiritual salvation, not a guarantee that we can always pray and have our physical ailments relieved. Sometimes Christians are goofy about this point. Uh, Tony Campolo, many of you were at our church when Tony Campolo spoke at our church a few years ago. He's one of the great heroes of the faith to me. Tony tells the story about being in a maximum security prison and he was with some guys that had been the worst of the worst, but they had received Christ, and he was healing their hearts and healing their minds, and they were having a little program, and there had an outside Christian speaker had come in, and it was a lady, and she came in, and she was decked out, and she was just lovely, and in her testimony, she began to talk about driving her new Mercedes to the prison, and how a rock had come up from the car in front of her and nicked the windshield and how she had put her finger on the windshield and prayed in Jesus name and how the windshield miraculously was healed and Tony said as she told that story he wanted to throw up because the guys that were there looked at her in utter disbelief which made me think of this quote from Lewis Smeads one of the great ethicist Christian ethics geniuses of the last generation Lewis Smeads said this the gospel does not clearly vindicate itself to the world when ministers proclaim the occasional release of affluent individuals from bearable aches and pains, while thousands of starving children call in vain to be fed, and thousands of oppressed people plead in vain for justice. Do you get what he's saying? He's saying when God heals our bunion on our foot, or God heals our windshield on our Mercedes, and you see starving children who are just begging for something, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. So, what do we do with healing? Well, here's what I do. I pray for everybody, and if God heals them, I say, thank you, God. And if he doesn't heal them, I say, thank you, God. I figure there's something that he wants us to learn through the experience, whatever it may be. I, I pray that I live to be 100 years old, that I preach here until my very last day, that, that I just don't have any sickness or any ailments, but who knows what may happen. And if I ever have something that is a terminal situation and by the way we're all terminal aren't we we all are going to have that we're all going to ultimately die but I pray if I ever have that situation I'll pray I'll ask God to take it from me but I will say, say like Jesus not my will but your will and whatever I have to have in this life Lord I, you, you've proved yourself with what Christ did on the cross you're not on the on the seat here whatever you want to do with my life is fine but then it's caused me to say, well, what do I do with some of these verses in the scriptures where Jesus and these 20% of the verses where he's healing people? And I thought, you know, there's some things I can learn from each one. So this is what I want you to get with me today. I want to give you four thoughts. And I want you to think about how it could relate to you. Now, don't just listen and say, well, that's a good, that's, that's a nice little lesson. 
How does it relate to you? Can you make this applicable to your life? And I want you to jot these things down. These are some things I believe at a deep spiritual level, and I'm going to remember. And so point number one, I'm going to remember because Jesus, the healer, has come. He healed my mind so I don't have to be confused like I used to be. When I read about Jesus healing people's minds in the Scriptures, people that were in great torment in their brain, I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus, for showing me that. How does that relate to me? I'm going to believe you're healing my brain. I'm going to believe that you're changing my mind. I'm going to believe that you are doing something in me that is transformational right here. Mark 5 tells a story. It's, kind of, it's an interesting story. Jesus shows up on the uh, outskirts of a town, and there is a crazy person who is living in a graveyard, cutting himself. They tried to... Uh, keep him in chains, but he breaks the chains. He's obviously been living outside for a long time. He is a crazy person. Side note, y'all remember Bonita that sang a few weeks ago? The first time I ever saw her, she was 19 years old. She was in a church play, and she played the crazy person from, called the Gadarene Demoniac, and she came screaming out of the back with these chains on and broke them, and that was my first introduction to our friend Bonita was her that playing that crazy person anyway this was a crazy person in the scriptures whose mind was messed up the bible says there were demonic spirits inside of this person and jesus meets this man and when this man meets jesus the demons inside of this man screech out and they say what have we to do with you jesus get away from us interesting how satan in our mind wants us to think jesus is an enemy not a friend jesus is our friend but Jesus looks at him and commands the evil spirits to come out. And they come out. And this is an interesting thing to me. Look at the verse. When they came to Jesus, when the crowd came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind. And they were afraid. All the people were afraid. That's kind of crazy to me too. Here's the man for the first time in years, and he's got it together. He's, he's right. And they're afraid because Jesus has obviously had an effect on him. Now, I have never been to the place that man has been. I have never been in a graveyard naked, chained up because I was hurting myself. But can I tell you something? I have known the grip of Satan on my mind. I have known what it's like to be locked up in my thinking. I have known what it's like to have stinking thinking. It's what some people call it, stinking thinking. Just, just the wrong thoughts here. And I know what it's like to have Jesus begin to wash my mind. I love this verse from Romans chapter 2. Look at this on the screen. Romans chapter 2 says this, chapter 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I want to ask you something. Is God doing a change in your mind? Because don't think that you're going to come to Jesus and your mind's going to stay the same. If you come to Jesus, he will change the way you think. Some of you get your worldview, listen, some of you get your worldview from television. Some of you get your worldview from talk radio. Some of you get your worldview from the internet. But when you learn who Jesus is, he begins to change your brain. And it's a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing when that begins to take place. I, was, I used to travel to Eastern Europe a lot, and in Estonia, Michael Ramon went to this prison with me. There was a prison. It had been a huge prison during communist days, and when the commun communism fell, this prison was really had become very poor, and uh, many of the prisoners had starved to death, and it had been a real brutal prison. But a friend of ours went into that prison as a chaplain, and Jesus actually came in with that chaplain, and this prison began to change. Um, it was an amazing thing to sit in a room with people and later learn the story, the, the horrible things these people had been a part of, but how now God had washed their brains and how they were new creatures. And they, they knew they'd serve the rest of their life there, but they were new creatures, and you felt they were your brothers in the Lord. I know some of you have some bad stuff in here. No, all of us have some bad stuff in here. Some of us were raised around prejudice, and it's here. 
You know what? Jesus will wash that away. You'll love people you didn't know you could love. Some of you have some other things here, some sexual situations that are just here. You don't like it, but it's just there. Can I tell you, Jesus, Jesus will wash it away. It's a process, but he'll do it. So when I see Jesus touching people in the Bible, I say, ding, 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 ding. Jesus can touch my mind, and he can heal my mind just like he can heal yours. Second thing, here's something I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember because Jesus, the healer, has come. He healed my paralysis. So I don't have to be frozen in my fear. He heals my paralysis, so I don't have to be frozen in my fear. Another great story of a healing in the Bible. Jesus comes to a gate. This is called uh, by the gate beautiful. It's in Jerusalem. There's a pool there, and crippled people would be taken there because there was a, a superstition that believed if an angel came by and an angel's wing touched the water and stirred the water, if a crippled person could be the first one in the water, they'd be healed. So people would lay by this gate for 30 years, 40 years, just hoping that somehow an angel would come by, touch the water, somebody would get them in first, and they would be healed. Jesus sees someone there. Look at what the Bible says in John chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8. Jesus saw him lying there, and he learned he had been in that condition for a long time. And so he asked him, do you want to get well? I always thought that's an interesting question. Do you want to get well? Let you in on a little secret. Some people don't want to get well. Some people want to stay right where they are. They're just comfortable. They just want to stay. And it's like, nah, that's not, I, I want to get better. I want to grow up. I want to learn some things. I'm, I'm 49. And y'all, I'm way different than I was at 40. I'm growing up. I, there's hope for me. By the time I'm 60, I can't imagine where God maybe could take me in 70. I want to be better than when I'm 60 and when I'm 80. I just want to grow so when Jesus says, do you want to get well? Yes, Lord, I want to get well. I want to get well. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. That was superstition. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. You know, the scripture, if you could read it in the original language, it's an awesome thing because it says those joints and, and those tendons, they were instantly made whole. He was able to get to his feet. Can you imagine everybody's looking as he walked away? Now, here's a point. Everybody didn't get healed that day. There's a lot of people laying around the pool that didn't get healed. But this man got healed that day. So what does that say to me? I've had this problem with my heel. Um, you ever heard of plantar fasciitis? I never heard of that, ever. So I went to the doctor a few weeks ago and found out there's something called plantar fasciitis. And Ethan said, Dad, that Eli Manning, the quarterback for the New York Giants, has that. And so I'm thinking, it must just be a problem great athletes have. Maybe just, <laughs> maybe Eli Manning and me, it's just something that you just get. And since then, I have found every woman over about 60 has the same exact thing. They have gone through it, so I lost a little bit of the, the sex appeal about that. But anyway, I've got this heel problem, and I've got to wear orthotics, and I've got to I walk funny in the morning and all that stuff. And I'm going to pray, God, I wish my heel wouldn't hurt. And I'm going to do the exercises they tell me to do. But I'm going to apply this different to my life. What I'm going to do in my life is I'm going to remember that Jesus can free me from some paralysis that I have, some fears that I have. Jesus can help me. My life at times feels like I'm paralyzed. Do you, does yours? Paralyzed. Sometimes I'm paralyzed because... I know I need to step into some uncharted waters, but I'm just afraid. So I think I'd rather stay here in what I know, but I believe out there's better, but this is somewhere new. Some of you are in that place today. You're in that place. And I want you to know God can let, give you strength and faith. He can allow you to not be paralyzed anymore, and he can lead you into that uncharted place. Some of you are in relationship ruts. When I say relationship ruts, I mean you're in some relationships that are damaging you. You've got some friendships around you that are hurting you. And you're stuck and you need to get out, but you can't get out. And I tell you something, God will give you the ability. God will give you the, the strength. I try to remember a couple of things. I try to remember that the number one command in the scriptures, if you count it up, what's the number one command? You've heard this a thousand times here. I'm not telling you anything new. Every time in the ancient world in the Bible when God would meet somebody, first thing he would say to them is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 
don't be afraid. Isn't that great? We think God's commandments are stop drinking. Stop this. And God's number one command is don't be afraid of me. I'm here to help you, not hurt you. That's one thing I try to remember. Another thing I try to remember is God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, the Bible says. He gives us a spirit of power. He gives us a spirit of love. He gives us a spirit of self-discipline. And so in my life, when I think I'm stuck, I say, God, you want me broken free from this paralysis. How do I do it? And I realize he can set us free. Number three. Third thing, because Jesus the healer has come, he healed my eyes so I can see things the way God sees them. Because Jesus the healer has come, he heals my eyes so I can see things the way God sees them. A lot of blinded eyes open in the scriptures. A lot of blinded eyes open in the scriptures. This is a funny one to me because some people want to have a formula for how God heals people, and they, they've got it figured out. And when people have stuff figured out, it worries me. Jesus in one place in the scriptures, just says, blinded eyes open, and they open. Another place in the scriptures, he touches them, and they are open. Another place, he mixes some mud with some spit and touches their eyes. And so I don't know why he does it different ways, but he did it different ways. The point is, he touched blinded eyes, and they opened. What does that mean to me? I see, but I don't see the way God sees And I believe every day he can touch my eyes and let me see more like God. A couple of thoughts. One, to see other people the way God sees them. Y'all, I wish everybody would get that. Do you know you've never locked eyes with an individual that doesn't matter to God? I'm talking about the poorest, most horrible person maybe you have ever met in your life. The person that is the farthest away from somebody you want to spend a second with. Can I tell you something? That person matters to God. You have never locked eyes with an individual who does not matter to him. And God help us if we could only see it like that. If we could only see people that are, some people that, some people are confused in their mind. They've got mental illness. They have poor learning. They've got sin that's twisted them up and and just got them in a knot. But I wish we could see them the way God sees them. I wish our heart could be for them in every situation. What does God say about this person? And we could love them. Our church has always said our first, when we we wrote out what our purpose statements were and how we were going to operate in our church, we said God loves all people regardless of their past or present condition and every activity of the church should reflect God's love for people. Every activity of our church should reflect God's love for people. You get drunk, you come to church the next day, you know what, sorry, but you're not in trouble. Everybody's got troubles. But you come here and you be mean to somebody here in this place, you be rude to somebody in this place, we got issues. Because in this place, we're going to be kind and loving to everybody that we come in contact to. That's what we're going to try to do is be kind and loving to them. So I want us to have eyes and see people the way the Lord sees. But you know something else? I want to see myself the way the Lord sees me. I want you to see yourself the way the Lord. And I don't mean see yourself horrible. I don't think that's what God wants. Remember a couple of weeks ago I talked about Jesus and how Jesus looked in people and Jesus saw men and women, and I really believe Jesus saw them as princes and princesses. He saw them as God's children. Other people would see an adulterer. Jesus would see a woman who was made in the image of God. And he would love her and honor her. And he saw in her her best possibilities. He wants us to see ourselves the same way. What do they say when you go to an AA meeting? You'll say, hi, my name is Ray and I'm an alcoholic. And I have a lot of, I love the whole 12 steps thing. That's good. But I like kind of the way we did it when we used to have our own meetings at our our church back in Stockbridge. We would teach people to say, hi, I'm Ray. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ who struggles with addiction. You get the difference? I'm not first and foremost an addict. I am first and foremost a follower of Jesus Christ who struggles with this or that. I want you to see yourself that way. I am first and foremost a follower of Jesus who struggles with internet porn. I am first and foremost a follower of Jesus who 